Sarah's favorite joke right now. My seven-year-old daughter's is, um, what do you call a woodpecker with no beak? A headbanger? <laughs> Testing. <laughs> so, good. Um, yeah, uh, uh, just recently became, um, in, it took a new role with GFK, and I wasn't really looking. I was having a lot of fun at Sudster, but this is a, it was an exciting opportunity for me. I just want to tell you a little bit about it, but what I'm going to end up getting into today is doing what in my role I ha I'm asked to do a lot, which is to come in and help define something with a client clearly enough where we can create a study to assess it and then ultimately to help them make actionable decisions. And so I've, that was cool. I've been doing that for a while. And um, ecosystems is one of those concepts that is on everyone's tongue these days, but is still fuzzy enough that we can't study it in its current framing. We need to, we need to think a little bit deeper about it. So that's what I'm going to get into today. And I mean, I, I'll, I'll just say in advance that this is a little bit like watching Sean White in a half pipe, if I'm lucky, which is it doesn't really matter exactly where he's going with this. It's how much style, you know, he shows on the way down there. So this really is about how to think about something that is an emerging technology or an emerging media in such a way that you can be um, ahead of it, you know. So, but a quick couple things about GFK. So this is a market research firm, fourth largest in the world after Nielsen and Kantar and whatever. Um, but I, one of the things I liked about it that I want you guys to know about it, because they're really just great growing their presence in the, in the U.S., is that they were formed uh, by German academics, actually, and so that I liked about it. And I spent a bunch of money myself reading German novels in college. I'm hoping to recoup that tuition dollars now. Um, but they are here growing in the Seattle area under their tech division, doing a lot of work for Microsoft. Microsoft looks like it might grow that work by many fold just year over year. And so I, I said this yesterday, and I'll say it again. If your resume has SPSS, PowerPoint, and any work with Microsoft on it, I, I, we'd like to see it. We'd like to see it. And so, um, but that's cool. And, and I'm kind of happy. The other thing about uh, that I'm going to show in here with GFK is that they're really interested in growing their thought leadership. And so there's a very, very good magazine called Tech Talk that has a lovely um, tablet-friendly interface. Um, they have a new edition just out this month, um, May 2013. The global editor of it is someone I get to work with over in, in Belgium when she's here and not in Korea or Paris or what have you. So let's, um, let me actually show you a couple of, a couple of things from Tech Talk that came out. Now this is a this is from August 2011, so again about six months old. And there was a study that GFK did, and this is one where we can just you know this wasn't for a client; it was just you know because you know some guys were curious. And uh, and it's a little bit small, but that really big bar there is asking people um, how likely. Um, Actually, uh, the question is, how hard do you feel, how difficult do you feel it would be to switch from your current service provider? And we found that the iOS owners felt that it would be harder to switch smartphones than it would be to switch bank accounts, and by a lot. Um, and the striking thing about that data point is that the, the banking industry recently has realized that because of its online banking and all the auto pays, it has created a wonderful hook creating huge switching costs to try to move away from that. I mean, raise your hand if you have no real love for your bank, but you know, you feel like removing your own circulatory system, you know, to sort of switch away from it. But I iOS users are actually way out in front of that and thinking how difficult it would be for them to switch. And that is not a perception that is held by all smartphone users. And if you mine a little bit deeper on this, Preeti and Garner um, uh, publication in, tech, in GFK Tech Talk from 2011, you also find this very regular correlation where the more services that you're using on your smartphone, defined as apps, what you see is this very regular increase where, um, yeah, if you're only using three or four apps, then your perceived difficulty of switching is high, but not huge. And then as you use more and more and more of those, you find, you find it more difficult to switch. So this is the kind of thing that got GFK 
Um, well, you know, and we went in thinking, this is an ecosystem study, okay? And these are the kind of pressures, and this is sort of the way that we're thinking about what an ecosystem was. Preeti and Garner kind of came out with this summary in that, in that, which is say, okay, well look, what, can we name something that we learned from this? What are the benefits of remaining in your ecosystem? And I kind of broke it down to three dimensions. Simplicity for you, uh, the integration, you know, between different devices and the execution and then the access. And, um, you know, uh, the other thing that is on people's minds when thinking about ecosystem is, um, are you locked into it? In the, in the same way that you are locked into a you know, contract for your mobile um, data provider and your voice provider. And what they have realized, and this is a brand new quote from just the May issue, they've re been returning to the issue, is that no, plenty of these ecosystems, you're actually not locked into it. But there are people who perceive not so much that I can't get out as I couldn't live without it, I couldn't do without it. So there are, you know, natural hooks. Well, this is just sort of the beginning of, of you know, what I'm going to talk about. Um, because, and I will confess, because researchers, if nothing, you know, we're supposed to be kind of self-critical. We, we brought the, the findings from this study into some clients, and the clients responded by saying, well, wait a minute, that's not the way we think of an ecosystem. Because the study was ultimately about loyalty. And uh, the GFK experts were talking about brands, you know. And when you're talking to someone who, let's say, at Microsoft is running the developer network, um, you know, or trying to get the developer network on, say, .NET to migrate over into the new languages and technologies and having a real time, they think of ecosystem in a completely different way. When you think of the channels that are supplying retail with um, the, the right new, new devices, Right, so you've got Samsung and HP and they're going to Best Buy and Staples. They think of an ecosystem in here. So this, this is where, you know, this sort of comes in, which is, well, maybe we need to, maybe we were really looking at just a slice of this, you know, in that sort of old metaphor where the blind man is holding on to the tail of the elephant and thinks it's the snake, you know, kind of, kind of mistake here. And so that's where we're going to jump off. And I wanted to put this up there. This is a good Gizmodo image. It's bandied about in ecosystem blogs and stuff. Want to do better than that too, because you can't just draw a bunch of companies and put lines between them and say, "There it is. There's an ecosystem." Because what those lines don't really communicate is what are the functional relationships between them? What does the line mean? So I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna try to um, dive into this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you two different ways of thinking. Part of the reason why I want to showcase the thinking on this as sort of one more lead-in sort of um, you know comment bringing this is one of the things that. Emicon aspires to is to get you to name or think of or identify a technology or a media before it exists. And that's hard. The worst way to be a futurist is to go do a Google search because what you will find already exists or to go to YouTube. You see what I'm saying? So how do you get ahead of it? And that's what I talked about last year. And at the, mo at the most, I've had a couple of victories where I was 23 minutes ahead of the, the announcement, you know, what it would be, and, but that's it. I mean, even to be 23 minutes ahead of whatever Apple's going to do next is what, what this group aspires to do in part. So I, I have been talking, and I will continue if you guys keep inviting me back to talk about how do you do that? And last, last year I said, well, one way is to not even look at the tech, look at the context. And of course, as a psychologist, I always want to say, don't look at the tech, look at the human nature. Well, and then, you know, in this today, I want to show you kind of, okay, well, um, do take some of these methods. So I'm going to show you two methods to define an ecosystem. One is a bottom-up method, where I'm going to start, and I'm going to show you a top-down method. So a bottom-up method is go out and scan what all of the chatter is out there and try to find the dimension. I'm going to do it qualitatively here, but what I'm showing you could be done algorithmically or it could be done with scrapes and, you know, the so social media intelligence that we're now seeing. But then the top-down way is to how do you come up with a brand new theory? or brand new theoretical definition. So let me go bottom up. This is what I did. I went out there and I just read everything um, of what people were talking about with ecosystems. So I did a scan of just what is, um, you know, what is the type of conversation. And, you know, if you looked across this, you've been looking while I've been talking, you probably see that there's an enormous amount of diversity in what people are talking about. 
from familiar user interfaces to um, you know, loyalty, like I was talking about, con devices controlling other devices. Um, you know, do your peripherals work? You know, you're going out there and buying a tablet, and then you're like looking at your printer and going, well, what am I going to do with you? You know, or something like that, or maybe some other, for, to content for sharing, to, to developer networks, to just, am I going to get the same customer service that I got before, you know? And these will all come up in ecosystem conversations. Well, so if that's the universe, a small universe anyway, of it, then the first way that those can be clustered would be from a technological point of view. That is, from people in the industry who are making this stuff and selling it. And here you can see that I've got like the blue honeycombs are from a device point of view. This would be the device perspective on an ecosystem. Things like, do we have um, interoperability? Can we take the same content and go from one device to another? I've actually seen that lately as the, another, just, that's the whole definition of ecosystem right there. You can take content from one device to another. You see things like screen sharing, um, you know, what's going on in the home. Now, if you switch over to the green honeycombs, now you're looking at a usability perspective on ecosystems, which is, I, I understand it, I can use the same login for different places, okay? Um, I, I make preferences somewhere, and then I'm able to put those preferences elsewhere. That comes up as an ecosystem feature. Uh, even things like, um, Microsoft, you know, Windows operating systems are supported for a lot longer after they're released than Apple operating systems are. Apple drops off the older ones a lot sooner than Microsoft. Did. This ends up being a very important part of a decision, at least uh, for sure, maybe not for consumers, but for someone who's trying to get IT for an entire company, right? What was, how long is this OS going to be relevant? You know, how long is it going to be supported? Anyway, so you can kind of go through this. You can see there's content. And then there's the brand ones, right, which is loyalty. Same customer service. Some people think of ecosystems that way. There's the access, that, um, which, you know, as you go through this. I, I added, the last two I added are in gray there, which are sort of just the operation part of an ecosystem. But I don't think that this is the way I want to study ecosystems because CFK studies consumer decision making. So I need to recluster this, not from a supplier's point of view, the techno geeks, but from the consumer's point of view. So same same nodes, just reclustered. And now you start to see a completely different set of dimensions emerge. Why do people not want to switch that ecosystem? They they want to save time, they want to save money, they want to save their creative product that they've made in the past. They want to save effort, particularly mental effort, okay? Um, those are in some ways, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the, the, the little efficiencies that they don't want to give up. But then there's the big stuff, and that is they want to broaden their access. I want to be able to compute in a place I've never been able to compute before. Quick little aside there. I don't know in all his brilliance that Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs ever realized that what he was making was the ultimate toilet computing device. <laughs> but that is what the iPad is. There's a brand new context where you can do computing that you weren't able to before. I remember, I don't, I don't have to go back too many years, I was doing a bunch of research for allrecipes.com, which is the number one cooking website based here in Seattle, right? And we were sitting around trying to brainstorm. How? People really don't like to print these recipes. How do we get off the computer into the kitchen? How do we do it? I mean, and this was, you know, uh, completely answered with the mobile revolution, you know, um, in a really short period of time, you know. So, I mean, just the idea of broadening access is just one of the huge characteristics of ecosystem. Is this a definition yet? No. I'm working for it, right? Okay, right. Um, emergent uses. This is the part that I'm going to try to end on, and this is, this is where we do try to become futurists. And that is when you look at the devices, the content, the users, the context, all of the stuff, the nodes, that you can name in an ecosystem, and then an entirely new use emerges from them that could scarcely have been predicted from its individual parts. You can look at a bee, a, a, a honeybee, all day long, and you will never be able to dream up a hive, because a hive is, the, is an emergent property of, of a bunch of bees. You know what I'm saying? The internet itself, you can look at 
a PC, you know, the, the PCs that Bill Gates put on every desk in, in every home in the world all day long, and you will never quite conceive of the internet. The internet was an emergent property of a couple of these different components. That is what an ecosystem is about, and we'll try to get, we'll try to get there in a minute. So once I sort of clustered these along the lines of what is important to a consumer, then, you know, then we can come up with a, a little picture that is simple to draw, but quite honestly, this is a model. This is now a functional definition in the theory of an ecosystem. And it comes down to this. When you think of all of the reasons why someone would buy into and remain in an ecosystem, you can, you can, you can map their advantages, which we just saw on the past slide, and then we really look at what would be the reasons, um, what would be uh, faced by someone switching ecosystems. It's pretty easy to say. These things are what they're going to incur some switching costs about. And those two things are why they might want to do that. And quite honestly, for most people in most, you know, in a snapshot of time, the balance between those are going to be tipped a little bit like how I drew it up there, which is there are not enough advantages to warrant the switching cost. And that's why, you know, you're going to answer your and I, and, I, and I really, you know, I mean, each one of these effort creations, money, time, and they very simply said that you can go into, you can go dive into each one of them. I mean, effort, really, just thinking about just the learning curve. That's a cost. You just don't want to go through a new learning curve. There's plenty of people on that on Apple devices now. Um, you know, saving your creation. This is the brilliance of Jobs, which is that, well, and, and saving money is that, you know, people had a couple of gigs of, of music and movies. You know, they would sooner, like, bleed to death than lose that. And, and I'm going to. Saving money and time. Seriously, even when you buy a new device, when you get it home, is it going to be a pain in the butt to hook it up? That matters. That matters when people are in retail stores and thinking about what they're going to get. Um, um, you know, saving time. So I think that that is sort of the, the bottom up way to do that. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned this quote a minute ago. Now let, let me keep going here. Um, I want to. I actually want to return to the slide, but I want to show you the other way to come up with a definition, which is more top down. Okay. And so this is from purely a theoretical perspective. Well, one of my favorite techniques for seeing into the future is using metaphor, using an analogy. And there's a lot of people in the philosophy of science who talk about the usefulness of a biological metaphor. So you take something you understand pretty well, like genes, and you use it as a metaphor to explain or define something that you don't understand very well, like what's happening with consumer technology in the home, a revolution that is ongoing, happening right now. And we've seen plenty of examples like this. I, mean, I bet a lot of you don't even really realize that the word meme was coined by a sociobiologist, and it was just saying that this is the cultural equivalent of genes. That's why I chose the word, because it was short. And then, at that point, we had all of the predictive power we needed. We said, OK, they spread through populations. They go mouth to mouth. We have these epidemiological things. That you can learn everything you need to know about how memes behave just by likening them to genes. Same thing with viral marketing. That's an epidemiology. Um, you know, thing. we heard Ken Russo here yesterday saying he specializes in media ecology, which is really what, you know, studying the ecosystem of media. Well, here we are with technical ecosystem. Hey, I didn't use a biological word to name this thing. Somebody else did. And all I'm saying here is, well, you already made the metaphor. You opened the door. What does a biological definition of ecosystem teach us about a tech one? And so if you had to say, OK, David, you came here and said you were going to define what a consumer ecosystem is, here's the slide that's going to get closest to it. And it's on the, the right side. But to get to that definition, I started on the left side with the best available, what I could find, bio definition of what an ecosystem was. And in the middle, it turns out that there is a very well-developed definition of business ecosystem, um, because there are a lot of inter interdependent players. So, you know, a bioecosystem. Some of the ones that you should know about, you should know about the sea otters and the anemone. Raise your hands if you remember that from grade school. Anybody remember that? The sea otters, the anemone, and the kelp. And if uh, the sea otters go away, then the anemone grow too much. They eat all the kelp, and you have these things called deserts, right? So you need the sea otters. 
And the other one you should know about is Yellowstone Park, the reintroduction of wolves and apex predators in the Yellowstone Park, wolves and grizzlies, had brought down the elk, which has really made the rivers thrive again. You can, you, you know, you can see um, better, even the fish are responding to the fact that they brought in wolves and so forth. So, so, so there's that. But when you really break it down, what metapatterning is about is you take the, the, really the nodes and the edges and something you understand. You take the players and their relationships, and you look for the similar player and relationship in the thing you don't understand. Okay, so the players in a, a, a biological ecosystem are the predators and the prey. Well, what is the what is the analysis of that? It's the consumers and the publishers. Somebody is making the nutrients, the edibles, and somebody is consuming the edibles. But you have to just get very metaphorical, and you have to say, look, the exact manifestation doesn't matter. It's the player and the relationship that helps you with this type of thinking. And we do have to absolutely have that. Now, the next line, maximizing fitness, this is sort of the why. Well, why do predators eat prey? Well, this is actually probably the thing where I'll admit this is the fuzziest part of this. That's because they want to. Right? Well, because they want to have fitness. They want to, you know, have babies and go forth and so forth. Why? Do we read all that stuff that publishers put out? Well, because we're maximizing consumer value. We leave that subjectively defined. But get into the next one. If you ignore, actually, I really, the last two. If you ignore either you know, the content or the devices or the context when you're defining ecosystems, you are missing out on a huge part of it. You cannot think about a sea otter without thinking about a California coastline. The geology is absolutely a player in the whole thing. You cannot think about an ecosystem unless you think about like Africa. What's happening as tech is migrating into Africa? Right now, there's some wonderful stories from that. Just as a quick aside, so Google, right, understands, and this is part of the ecosystem. A lot of people's first purchase into an ecosystem is the smartphone. This is globally now. Not the PC, like an emerged market, but it's the smartphone. So we call this kind of phone-first ecosystem. Well, Google wants you to buy it, right? They want you to buy an Android. You buy the Android. What do you do on the Android? You, you use all the Google services. Google is willing to actually give everything away because what they want to do is make money off the ad sales. All they really care about is the eyeballs, right? They got into, uh, an, into I think, the southern parts of Africa, and they're like, oops, we don't have a data provider. We don't have any internet. Well, you know, Google did <laughs> an internet provider in Africa. And it's just sort of like, well, we just need all the pieces of the ecosystem. Well, if you don't understand the market that you're in, then you really don't understand you know, your ecosystem. Well enough. Okay, well, I'm getting pretty close to time, but let me talk about like, some ideas that now that we have a functional definition, and this is the kind of thing where we can now study it. It's like, okay, we need to know the consumers and players and what they're sharing and why they do it and what they're doing it on and, and the use of contents. And once we have that, we have a pretty comprehensive definition of the ecosystem. Um, you know, but what are some of the insights that this, that this fosters? Actually, now, let, at this point, let me actually go back to this slide. I tweeted this earlier today. This is an awesome report that Google did. And one of the things that they looked at was just a great question, which is, what kind of activities do you start on a smartphone and then later move to a PC on? And it turns out what people do is they will search and they will do social stuff. And those, that's the kind of activity where in the same day or the same session, they'll start it on a smartphone and then continue it on a PC. Uh, what about stuff you start on a PC and then continue on, on, on a mobile device, like a tablet? Well, that's like uh, planning a trip or doing your banking. That kind of complicated stuff, people will start on a, on a PC, but then end up finishing it on something else. What about uh, things you start on a tablet and then continue? That's where people are doing more multimedia stuff. They need the bigger screens. They're shopping, right? Or they're watching a video. And that's where we'll start. And this is one of those realizations. You guys remember those whole Samsung commercials now? It's like, oh, you can watch the same movie on this screen, this screen, this screen, and this screen. Turns out a lot of people don't really care to do that. <laughs> um, the incidence of people jumping between all of these devices watching a video is way lower than the incidence of people doing their banking or shopping or social or, or just search on it. But one of the things that also really struck me and this is like the first emergent property is, you know what turns out to be the best way to get content from one device to another? Now granted, Microsoft will have you bleeding and we, and we hope to see it by 2019 that we can just do the near field communication and just do a device-to-device -device swipe, which we will be able to do. 
But we, don't, we can't do that today. So you know what is the next best alternative? Search. Google turns out to be the best connected tissue to get the same device, the same content on one device or another. You don't go back and go to the URL on your PC. Too, too laborious. You don't go back, you know, and, you know, but instead what you do is just research the same thing that you search for. There are very few exceptions to do that. They found in this study that um, whether you're searching or surfing or shopping or watching content, um, search is at least equal to or beats out um, you know, navigating directly to it or anything. So this is in the, this would maybe be our first emergent property. Search, although you didn't really know this from the day one, turns out to be the way that we create cables, invisible cables between devices. You research it because search is just so ridiculously efficient. So if you are right now thinking of a way to get stuff off the tablet and onto the television at home, that's what you're up against. You have to be just re-googling it on the next device because that right now is the best, most efficient way to do that. You know what I mean? It's, you know, it's a cable in a new way. So that's a good emergent property. I know I'm a little bit out of time, but um, Jen, can we just show one of these? I just want to show um, quickly uh, that video of Android and Tasker, which is the third one, the third one down. And I'll just talk through it really quick, but one of the things we're going to get with these ecosystems is we're actually going to get more energy efficiency because, yeah. And you know, you just play it. We don't have any sound, but you can just get the idea. What is this guy doing? The guy is not just have one, you know, um, one mo uh, screen monitor controlling another monitor. He's controlling all the lights in his home. He's controlling the, the temperature. You know, he's walking in. He can get that all set and automated. You know, so, you know, what are we, what, what's going to be, that's an example of emergent property. You might not be able to predict it from, you know, this whole stack, but what you're going to be able to get here is, um, um, you know, is environmental control more than you had before. The automatic car that people are talking about will also be an emergent property that's coming out of all of these different pieces. The traffic cameras are going to tell you about what's speeding up or slowing down. You'll have some sensors, you know, you've got devices and so forth. Um, you should watch this whole video, it's pretty cool. So what they've done here is they have taken a projector like that one, retooled it for the living room, and instead of shining it to replace your TV, they're shining it at your TV, and they're extending what is on the TV off the side of it. But the cool thing about the projector, it has a very smart sensor where it actually reads all of your shelves and stuff, and then adjusts accordingly. So this is an emergent property. Well, now, and they, they got little, just the, the, the smallest little, look at that. They're actually visually making your whole living room blur with like a uh, concussion of something on a game. And they're doing that just with a projector of light on your existing, you know, on your, what they do is they take a picture of your shelves, shine it on your shelves, and then blow the picture of your shelves on your shelves and make your shelves look like it. And then there's a little thing where like a ball will bounce on the TV and then it'll roll onto the floor. And so, you know, but it's a projector. It's a projector, and it's a, a, a distance sensor, and it's a TV, and it's an Xbox. You know, Microsoft is searching like that. And I don't know, I mean, this is the hard part, but, and um, unfortunately, this is where we trail off, and unfortunately, where in some ways I fail you. It is the, to get to see the emergent property, which will be the only reason people switch ecosystems, you do have to whoosh, go beyond what is currently known and make a prediction. So let us go. Okay, well thank you, thank you very much.